Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of the Friday at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. Uh, good morning, Martin. How are you? Good morning, Pete. Do it, doing fine, doing fine. Uh, nice sunny day. Looking forward to uh, to doing part two of this. Uh, part one was a lot of fun yeah who did it better so uh, we want to thank uh one of our viewers who came up with this idea so if you watch part one or actually if you didn't watch part one you may want to go check that out first uh but basically these are bands that had some sort of a split and then the two factions were like out at the same time releasing new albums and it could be it's in most of these instances a couple in a row where at the time all the talk was about well which album is better because such loyal fans of the original group and now you had in a lot of instances you had parts of the fan base were kind of divided on which they like better some like both right but there was there was a lot of talk about you know the competition behind the scenes so we've got five more instances of where this happened and i'll have martin kick us off with his uh, first choice for today all right. So my first choice, and again, I mean, the neat thing about this concept is we are trying, you know, trying to rise to the challenge of, of finding new ways to talk about uh, this sort of stuff. So, I mean, I am, I am going to talk about um, Van Halen versus David Lee Roth. And I think it, this is a little bit like our, um, you know, not, not as bad, but it's a little bit like part one's Montrose situation where it's like, is there enough talent to go around to 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 make the situation absolutely magic so when you had eddie and dave together it was absolutely magical again i i keep bringing up the who all the time for some reason but van halen are the ultimate example of a band that is like the who where uh you know i i did an episode of history and five songs on this where it's like a I called it a band of personalities, that episode, right? So it's, so you've got four different personalities in this Van Halen band. Um, but when you break up the parts, what happens? Well, you get David Lee Roth trying to do uh, an Alcatraz, Steve Vai kind of situation, bring in Steve Vai. Um, but it, it, you get David Lee Roth trying to, tr trying to make a speedier, efficient, younger, faster, more colorful version of Van Halen. And that's really kind of all he's got going for a vision. Uh, otherwise, it's the David Lee Roth show. It's the David Lee Roth personality. Love it, hate it. Um, but that's what you're trying to get. Uh, that's what he's trying to convey uh, with this solo situation. It's a, it's a true, it, it's a David Lee Roth personality situation for like 55% of the band leaving 45% of it to the instrumentalists and their personalities and their writing, which frankly isn't much to write home about. The writing is, is just not all that particularly great. What happens over the Van Halen camp? Well, they have to replace a lead singer who's larger than life. And they do find a guy who has quite a, quite a long track record and the history of with this great band Montrose. So they're bringing in a guy who's had, uh, you know, this solo career that's been, it, it started a little rocky, it got a little better. He had some, he had some success, some gold and platinum albums. So they bring in Sammy Hager, um, you know, long and short of it, who does it better? I think both of them uh, fall short of, uh, of Van Halen when it is Eddie and Dave together, uh, these two great talents. So I, I think you, you break this up and uh, the sum uh, the parts are definitely not as great as the sum, and uh, and I think both of them more or less falter. David, David, kind of, you know, he both both situations. The albums get farther and farther apart. They get less good, and um, and and really, there's there's not a lot of uh, prolificness. There's not a lot of productivity out of out of either situation. So. Ah, uh, basically, you know, to be brutal about it, you know, there's a couple others and there's, there's where it gets really bad. Your filthy little mouth and, you know, balance isn't all that well regarded. Basically, uh, they killed the Golden Goose and the Golden Goose was the original Van Halen, uh, essentially. I mean, there was still a lot of commercial success, but the creativity, uh, big drop down in both situations. Yeah, I mean, as far as creativity, surely. I mean, I think both entities made a lot of money off of those albums apart. For I mean, it's when you look at, it, I mean, those those Hagar albums, you know, had a ton of hit singles and sold a lot. But yeah, from a creative standpoint, and and I think like for for me, those first couple of David Lee Roth solo albums, you know, especially when he had you know Vi and Sheehan and that that really hot band, it was more like you were impressed by the musicality of them. But from a creative standpoint, from a songwriting standpoint, that stuff really doesn't hold up that well. 
other than the fact that, wow, listen to those guys play. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the Van Halen stuff with Sammy brought in a, a, a larger audience for the band. Uh, whereas I think most of the, the fans of the early years were just, you know, definitely hard rock fans and guitar fans and whatnot. And then all of a sudden you have the band trying to become much, much more melodic, relying less on the guitar histrionics and more of like trying to, you know, really just write songs that, that anybody could get into. So, and, and that's kind of taken it away from the original vision of Van Halen, I think. So good choice. All right. As in part one, uh, we're going to go down the Black Sabbath route. So in part one, I talked about the, the Ozzy Black Sabbath split and subsequent kind of competition. Now we're going to do Black Sabbath and Ronnie James Dio. So, of course, uh, Ozzy, I mean, Ronnie and the band did those two massive albums together, Mob Rules and Heaven and Hell. And then uh, once Live Evil basically hit the streets, that was already done. And you've got Ronnie and Vinny off to do their own thing. So in 1983, and I forget exactly which one came out first, but we're going to start with the Holy Diver album comes out. This is Ronnie's new band, of course, a great band. He's got uh, kind of like the Ozzy thing all over again. He's got, you know, Jimmy Bain, a known quantity on bass, good songwriter. You've got uh, Vinny on drums. You've got this hotshot young guitar player from, uh, from, Scotland, Ireland, is he Irish, Scottish? Oh, uh, Viv? Yeah, yeah, Irish. Irish, yeah, no. Uh, and he basically is the is the fresh new face, really, really good guitar player. Was it got. Northern Ireland? Jeez, I'm not sure. It's I think Dublin or Belfast, right? Yeah, I don't remember exactly where. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Hmm. But, you know, he was, he was pretty much a, uh, I'm trying to think if it says anywhere here, pretty much not a known quantity. Um, and that's the, that's the basis for the new band. And they put out this, what is arguably uh, their greatest album, the debut album, Holy Diver, which is just packed to the gills with classic Dio songs. And at the same time, uh, a chance meeting in a pub in England where uh, all the guys got pretty, pretty hammered. And, and during the, uh, the events of that evening, it was decided that Ian Gillen was going to be the new singer for Black Sabbath. Uh, for the Born Again album, of course, and there's a whole backstory here about how Ian had taken time away from the Gillen band to kind of rest up his his uh, voice, his throat, and the guys in Gillen were just kind of waiting for Ian to come back and say, I'm ready, and then next thing you know, you're reading the papers that Ian has joined Black Sabbath, which leaves the rest of the Gillen band kind of like out in, you know, in no, no man's land. So, you know, here you have these two albums, this of which I think surprised a lot of people. A, it's got this, you know, pretty gruesome album cover art. It's dark, it's murky, it's really heavy. The product, the mix is obviously what most people t tend to talk about. But I think the whole aura of seeing Ian Gill in fronting Black Sabbath, you know, you got Deep Purple and Black Sabbath meeting halfway here. Uh, for a lot of people, pretty interesting. And that's the hook. So they went out and tour for this. They're still playing big arenas at this point in time. The album's selling okay, but not quite what Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules are selling. I'm sure this uh, album cover had a little bit to do with that. Uh, and this actually does quite well. I believe this went gold or maybe reached platinum many, many years later, but this is doing pretty good. Uh, it's got the big kind of like single MTV hit, you know, um, uh, Rainbow in the Dark, John a blank there. Uh, and this is like the big up and coming band. And Ronnie is like, you know, okay, this is my band, whatever. So they do that. So Dio at, at all this, Dio is the one that I think is, is really capturing uh, the public's uh, eye. And before you know it, after the tour, you know, Ian is obviously out of Black Sabbath because we've got the Deep Purple reunion. Uh, so after that, we've got basically the same Dio lineup comes up with the second album, The Last in Line, which also does very, very well. Black Sabbath is retooled once again. You've got now you've got Geezer out. Uh, Bill was obviously out for the tour for Born Again. Bev Bevan came in. Bev is out. Ian is gone. So Tony Iommi decides he's originally going to do a solo album. So he rec recruits in a bunch of dudes and most notably Glenn Hughes on vocals. Well, the record label decides this is going to be the new Black Sabbath album featuring Tony Iommi, not a Tony Iommi solo album. Seven Star, which doesn't do all that great, but is actually a very, very good album. It's a little different. Great performance by, uh, by Mr. Hughes. And they go out on tour, which is pretty much a disaster because Glenn is a complete mess at this point in time. They bring in Ray Gillen to finish the tour. So this is kind of seen as a disaster. This does really well. Uh, 
they follow that up again, same lineup for Dio with Sacred Heart, which sees a little bit of a slip in sales from the first two. I think the, you know this album is a little lighter, perhaps a little more commercial sounding than the first two, but still really solid. They're, Dio is playing big arenas at this point. Uh, Sabbath now has released The Eternal Idol. You've got Tony Martin on vocals now, complete reshuffling of the lineup. This kind of begins the kind of revolving door of Sabbath that's going to continue throughout the rest of the decade until they get back together with Dio and and uh, and uh, Vinny a couple of years later. Um, but this is probably the last big album from Dio. And then, you know, Vinny obviously leaves. I mean, Vivian leaves, getting Vivian, Vinny, all these names, geez. And he, he winds up leaving the band. Uh, he's got like a little dispute with Ronnie. In comes, you know, another guitar player, new other new players. Uh, but, you know, right around this time is where you're starting to see the success of both entities starting to waver a little bit as we're getting ready to move into the late eighties and the early nineties. But the, the big kind of competition between them was happening, you know, right around these four albums right here, but clearly uh, Dio was the winner here, I think out of them. And, and it, depending on your preference and what you like better, I mean, there's good stuff on both albums. Um, I love born again and seven star quite a bit actually. <clears throat> but as far as like, you know, cohesive band releases, I mean, it's hard to argue against Last in Line and Holy Diver. I mean, those are those are really, really solid to great records, depending on your opinion on them. So there you go. Yeah, the only thing I'll add, and by the way, I'll, I'll go to the deal camp as well. But the only thing I'll add is that um, uh, Holy Diver and Last in Line are, are the true follow ups to Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules. Yeah, You've got the one. singer, the lyricist, the drummer, who's a distinct drummer. And um, I think most of those riffs could have been Tony Iommi riffs. I mean, they're not that different uh, than, than what you get on, on, you know, the sum total of Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules. They don't, they, you know, Viv and Tony don't solo the same way. But now when, once you get down to guitar solos, you're talking about uh, something much more arcane than, than vocals and lyrics and songs and all that stuff. You got to be a real music fan to really care or notice, you know, that the, the, you know, articulate the personalities between those two things but those riffs those songs uh could have been uh could have easily been tony iomi riffs and songs and and don't forget ronnie wright's music as well so uh absolute just he's just carried on it's just it's just mob rules part two yeah basically so, yeah. yeah yeah all right my next choice is uh is pink floyd uh versus roger waters um and i think they start diverging at this point Animals is where they really start, you know, Roger starts kind of taking over and it becomes Rogers' vision uh, more so and, and on the wall and especially on Final Cut. And uh, I firmly, firmly fall in the Rogers or, or the Roger Waters uh, camp. I don't think um, Momentary Lapse of Reason was that good of an album, except for Learning to Fly. Uh, Division Bell is quite panned out there in the prog world, I, I've noticed. Uh, a lot of people are not big fans of this. You know, Pink Floyd, there started to become kind of a bad vibe around the whole thing, but I think even more so this has been seen as one of the big corporate bands of all time. And especially when you get into this period. And then, you know, I, um, I looked down upon them also because all they ever managed was an 87 album and a 94 album. And that's it, you know, endless river, who cares. Right. Um, but, but, you know, for them to only come up with that and, you know, granted, um, Dave, David Gilmour has had a, quite a successful solo career, and he's been semi-prolific eventually. Um, but I'm I'm not a big David Gilmour fan. Uh, I love I love the um, the vision and the Pink Floydness and the um, the ambition of a Roger Waters. I love this album. Um, there's the early ones, the the t the two early ones, right? Um, and they're both perfectly good albums, despite the, the terrible futuristic looking 80s album covers. They're actually, you know, just pretty good proggy kind of albums. This is a masterpiece. Um, one thing I always joke about Roger Waters, uh, it's Roger Waters and Steve Hackett that you can't set your volumes, uh, your, your, your volume to because everything's either you can't hear it at all because it's so hushed and quiet or it's an explosion of some sort. And it's literally an explosion with, with Roger, right? Um, but um, I love Roger to death because uh, uh, I, I can never get this title right because it's so bloody hard to, is this the life we really want? Uh, is one of my favorite albums of the last 20 years. I just played this 
a few hundred times. Love it to death. Again, another terrible album cover. Um, but I just, I just love what Roger has done with his life creatively. Um, I think these albums are amazing and I'm just not a big David Gilmore fan. Um, I just, I like everything about Roger is I even like his singing better than David's right. Which is probably a travesty. Um, so, so uh, I didn't mean I, di I didn't mean to make this a Roger versus David Gilmore, but but even a Roger versus Pink Floyd, I think there's no no question. I mean, given that Roger really, I mean, Roger's really only done the four albums, and Pink Floyd's done the two, so they're not super prolific. But this just is the icing on the cake. I love this album to death. So there you go. Roger Waters absolutely wins over Pink Floyd. Yeah, the interesting thing here is that, uh, and I guess you can kind of point to Gilmore here because he's been the driving factor behind Pink Floyd since Roger left. It's almost like David doesn't want to do anything with Roger, but yet he doesn't want to do a Pink Floyd album either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, when you really look at the, you know, just two albums in all those years, that's all you could do. Um, and it's not like he's done a ton of solo albums either because he doesn't have that many of them. Yeah. So it's almost like just Gilmore just didn't want to do much of anything. It's like, yeah. definitely, definitely don't want to work with Roger anymore. Don't want to do that. But yeah, even the Pink Floyd thing, eh, I don't need to do that either. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Did he just get tired of the music industry in general and having to write and record albums, uh, you know, touring, all that stuff? I mean, it's just amazing, kind of like the inactivity when you really look at it. And he needed armies of people to do those records, do, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, to, to put it all together. So it's not really even feeling like a band either. And they both feel really corporate. You know, they just, they just seem, they seem really forced. And it's like, oh, we got to put together a prog album. What does a prog album sound like? There's, they're just, they're really, they're, they're, they're oddly conservative at the same time as, as, as they're supposed to be prog and conservative and prog are not supposed to go together. Yeah, I mean, they, they both have their moments. I mean, I do like both albums, but I, I don't generally rank them up fair, that high when you when you look at the classic Floyd albums. I mean, they don't they don't sound natural and organic like all those classic Floyd albums. I know we're talking about different eras here, uh, but it, it, it's you're right. They do seem a little cold and forced, whereas, you know, you never really could say that about the old classic Pink Floyd stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. My next choice, uh, Marillion and Fish, otherwise known as Derek Dick. Uh, so we all know the story. We've talked about it here often enough. Uh, late 80s, Fish decides that uh, he has had enough of the Marillion machine. He you know, saw the band getting bigger and bigger, although never a huge band to begin with. But, you know, all of a sudden they're opening up for Rush and some other high profile gigs. And he's in the band's partying a lot, especially him. And uh, I, I was actually watching the Blu-ray of the Fugazi box set last night. They have a, a recent interview with all the guys in the band done last year. And, you know, he talks about how, uh, you know, especially on the uh, starting with the Fugazi album and subsequent albums and tours in the studios on the road, there's cocaine everywhere and all this kind of stuff, or as he says, cocaine. Um, and uh, he at some point, even though he seemed like because he was the focal point of the band, he seemed like he loved was loving being a rock star deep down inside that really wasn't what was going on with him. And he was kind of thinking that this is a little bit too much for me. So he decided after the Clutching at Straws album, which <clears throat> to me is their classic album. And basically that's very autobiographical kind of what he was going uh, through in his life uh, as the tortured kind of rock star sitting at the bar, you know, and just having a hard time dealing with life and how everything is just like, oh, this is not where I want uh, my life going. He decides to step away from the band to basically do a solo career at his own pace, right? Uh, they bring in, Marillion decides to carry on. They bring in Steve Hogarth, uh, pretty much an unknown singer at the time. And uh, basically 1989, you get Season's End, which is the first album with Hogarth, with a lot of the material on this album was already being kind of put together by the band when Fish was still in, in the group. So the, this does not sound that unlike the Fish era uh, material basically at the same time uh shortly thereafter we get fish's first solo album a vigil in a wilderness of mirrors <clears throat> with that great album cover which to many people this is still the classic fish album it's not quite what he was doing with marillion it's very uh 
you know, he's a Scotsman. It's very Scottish sounding. There's a mix of prog and just uh, very atmospheric and gritty rock music on here. And I think most of his catalog has kind of followed suit. He never really went back to that kind of neo prog style that he was doing with Marillion. They, they, these became much more personal albums full of different flavors and things like that. Each album is very different. So this was kind of the start for the both of them. And then uh, they followed that up. Uh, let's see, we had Holidays in Eden in 1991 <coughs> from Marillion, second album with Hogarth. This is definitely more of like, like kind of like a rock album. It's not, I mean, there's some prog on here, but they're doing some stuff that's kind of like un-Marillion-ish, uh, which I think upset some of the fans, you know, the longstanding fans from the Fish era. Uh, he then comes out and puts in the same year, Internal Exile, another really strong album with lots of different flavors on it. You know, proving to be a guy that can, he can write his own stuff. He's always known as a lyricist, right? But he's got a very, very good band on here. Very solid album. Uh, the band then returns back with uh, Brave in 1994, which is a huge concept album. And for many fans, this brought Marillion back into, all right, they're back with doing the kind of prog we like from the band. Very dark, mysterious, complex album. Whereas Fish then comes back with something completely different in Suits, which is filled with lots of pop songs and just really up-tempo, fun material, but prog rock, this is not. And, you know, they, both entities would go on, you know, being fairly prolific throughout the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, Marillion would kind of start doing some alternative grungy stuff later in the decade, which was kind of strange. They would return back to Prague, start to do more atmospheric rock things. Uh, and they basically just were like, you know, we're going to do what we're going to we're going to do. But we're not returning to that 80s sound of the stuff that we did with Fish. Marillion, I think, was always pretty steadfast in that we're going to kind of go in a different direction. This is where we're at. At now uh, they kind of started the whole crowdfunding thing to because obviously you know the sales of physical product were starting to wane so they were one of the original bands that were asking their fans to kind of contribute money to help them put together albums and fish just kept you know pumping out one after another he worked with steven wilson on an album or two uh, to some pretty good results. He would come tour here sporadically. We haven't seen him in quite a while. Uh, he would also do these kind of festivals over in Europe where he would do like old classic Marillion songs and albums. And uh, But th they would never kind of get back together uh, to do anything at all over the years, even though I, I know they've, they've spoken and they've, they've been in the same room uh, for various interviews and things for DVDs and stuff like that. But, uh, but yeah, they both went their own separate ways. And Ironically, neither one of them really returned to the type of music that they did together on those four classic 80s albums. And uh, yeah, I guess give them credit for doing that. You either love it or you don't, right? There are some people I know that listen to the early Marillion albums. They love those. They don't like the fish stuff. They don't like the latter, latter period Marillion stuff. And there's other people like myself who have enjoyed both of what they have done to, you know, separately. Uh, maybe it's not quite as good as those four albums they did together, but still, uh, you know, if I was to pick uh which i like better it's hard to say there are there are moments where i think marillion has the stronger catalog apart uh but there are some of the fish albums that i enjoy immensely and they both have released about the same amount of albums uh, apart from each other so this one is almost like a tie uh i have albums i like and don't like from both so it's kind of hard to say but both both pretty strong catalogs apart from each other so i'll just kind of leave it that yeah I think I would fall in the fish camp more. Um, I love his voice. I love his lyrics and they're still quite autobiographical. Uh, it yeah. seems, um, you know, uh, slightly veiled, but I, I, I love his, he is again, one of these creatively fearless guys. I mean, so is Marillion. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I have piles of both catalogs, but I, I would say I play modern day fish uh, more than I play modern day Marillion. And yeah, I just, you know, just love the whole idea of fish, the whole philosophy of who he is and what he's done. So I think how I'll end it is I'll say there are a couple of Marillion albums that they've done with Hogarth that I think are better than anything fish has done in his solo catalog. Okay. But there are a number of Marillion albums that I really don't like much. Uh, yeah. especially some of the latter period ones I find pretty boring and uninspiring. Uh, I think the fish catalog is probably stronger start to finish 
-hmm. Like I said, there's a couple of, you know, Brave is one, a perfect example. I mean, this to me is a great achievement and this is better than any solo album that Fish has done, but he's got more that I like. Uh, I, there's really not any Fish solo albums that I really don't like. There's some I like better than others, but there are a number of Marillion albums I really just I can't even listen to, uh, even though there's a few of them that are immense, like Season's End is absolutely amazing uh, as well. So, yeah, so it, it's kind of hard. Uh, it, that's, um, it's, it's, it's hard to say with these guys because there's, there's a little bit of a difference there. You've got so, you know, some, a very strong across the board catalog and then lots of peaks and valleys on the Marillion side. So. Yeah. All right. Okay, my next choice is... Alice Cooper versus, so we've got Alice Cooper as a solo artist starting here versus <laughs> Billion Dollar Babies. There you go, the Battle Axe album. And this rare CD, um, sort of an anthology of all yeah. their stuff that came out, right? Um, so essentially what happens here is it's just, it's such a, uh, a lesson in branding. Uh, Alice Cooper, really it was destined uh, given as soon as he started calling himself Alice Cooper and given he's such a great interviewer and singer and personality and he's kind of like the front guy of the band and he kind of always was and he had the had the makeup going but essentially what happens is um, you know they all get tired there's problems with Glenn Buxton etc Alice and Shep kind of you know, step aside and put their arm around each other going, you know, why don't we just do a solo thing? Uh, you know, and there's various reasons they talk about uh, for the band breaking up, but Alice just goes even bigger and bolder and has a great success with this. And then there's the TV movie. And um, it's almost like, it's almost like he doesn't miss a beat, even though the entire band is gone and they've been a consistent band all along. Um, it turns out that, um, they weren't really that needed for uh, for uh, for the songwriting. Uh, you know, he can still he can still have hits that are mellow hits. He can have ballads. He can have hard rock songs that sound pretty good. He he fortunately uh, discovers Dick Wagner, um, so he continues on, doesn't miss a beat. You know, there's a little bit. Uh, the show gets even bigger. There's you know the dispute of of whether the guys wanted to tone down the showmanship and, and have a bigger situation that way. Um, but he does that, you know, he, later, later he becomes, I mean, he's, he's still a brand with the heavy songs, the mellow songs, but uh, the rest of the guys, there they are. Um, they have to get a new lead singer and they have this situation, which is, uh, turns out to be a huge disaster financially, creatively. Nobody likes this album. It's, it's not, um, it's not well recorded. There's not good songs on it. They spend a lot on having this big show where they've got this big plexiglass thing and they're battling. Um, and that thing doesn't last very long because it's too expensive to keep on, on the road. And it just absolutely crashes in flames. Um, we get nothing out of these guys. We get a low key, uh, Michael Bruce album granted on Polydor 1975. Dennis is gone. Uh, Neil Smith doesn't do anything, always threatening to do something. Nothing ever happens. Eventually in the, in the like two thousands, late nineties, I mean, Neil has platinum God, uh, you know, Dennis comes back strong eventually in life with, uh, first he has that solo album. Um, and uh, what is it called? Bones from the Yard and then Blue Coop with uh, with Alan Joe. Um, so he's been prol prolific lately. And then Neil even got fairly prolific. Uh, but yeah, these guys absolutely faded into the woodwork and did kind of nothing while Alice uh, just kind of kept his star alive and had, you know, somewhat success. But he kicked off with a lot of success uh, with with Welcome to, to My Nightmare. So again, the um, the um, the lesson here is lead singer, the guy who does all the interviews, the super famous guy, the guy named after the band, the band named after the guy, whatever. Uh, and he just goes on and, and, and most people don't even notice, especially when there was no internet um, and you had, you know, magazines and all that stuff. It was like, it was like nothing happened. It's like, oh, muscle of love. Welcome to my nightmare. So Pretty seamless, okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that billion dollar. I mean, that's like one of the big that album and tour is like one of the biggest disasters of all time, right? Yeah. And that album amazing cover, album cover. We love it. Amazing album death, cover. You know? It's like, oh, this has got to be heavy. It's gonna be great. And then you listen to it, you're like, yeah. oh, this kind of sucks. Yeah, that's a shame. That's a shame. Oh well. All right. So my next choice is uh we're gonna do Queen's Reich versus Jeff Tate, which uh, you know, we've we've talked a lot about over the years. 
Uh, but this is a perfect example. So, and I don't have any of the, uh, the Jeff Tate solo stuff on physical copy, but basically we know the story, right? Uh, after Empire, band is huge. They released Promised Land uh, not that long after. Promised Land doesn't do all that well. They put out another album after that. Eventually, Chris DeGarmo leaves the band, who was one of their chief songwriters and co-lead guitar player. Uh, you got albums like uh, Q2K and Here in the Now Frontier and Tribe and Universal Soldier and Operation Mind Crime 2. I mean, none of these albums do well at all. Uh, they keep getting further and further away from the classic Queensryche sound. They're one of these metal bands that like are in the 90s stuck trying to figure out what the hell to do because the old way of doing things doesn't sell anymore. Uh, you've got grunge and alternative and all these other different styles of music and new metal all is, is what's all the rage. And a band like Queensryche are just like, you know, how do we fit in here? Uh, and so they keep going further and further away from their classic sound. They get some lineup changes. Uh, and it seems obvious that, that Jeff Tate uh, and his vision of where the band should go and the rest of the band is kind of like on two different planes. So eventually they do part ways uh, and uh, they go and the band goes and gets another singer, Todd LaTorre, okay, who was in Crimson Glory previously. Uh, they've released the self-titled Queensryche album in 2013, which basically sounds like early Queensryche. So now they're, they're trying really hard to get back to that 80s sound. Uh, meanwhile, Jeff Tate puts out Jeff Tate's Queensryche the same year, an album called Frequency Unknown with all sorts of other players, he, you know, that, and that's been kind of his mantra on all his releases since he's got like this whole cast of characters that comes in and out of the albums. Uh, that basically, that album doesn't really do much of anything. This really doesn't do much of anything sales wise either. Uh, but, you know, now all of a sudden you got the two factions. There's this big court thing that happens. Uh, the guys are able to keep the Queen's right name. He decides to change it to Operation Mind Crime is the name of his new band. Uh, the guys come back with Condition Human in 2015, which for a lot of people was one of the best albums of the year. Now they're, you know, the band really sounds like classic Queensryche. You got a singer who sounds a lot like Jeff Tate, brings his own, you know, characteristic to the band as well. But it's got that classic sound, which everybody loves. Uh, Operation Mind Crime, on the other hand, they released The Key in that same year, 2015. It's kind of like a trilogy thing. Uh, Resurrection in the following year, 2016. Again, you got Rudy Sarzo and the, uh, Simon Wright, all these guys playing on the album, all these drummers and guitar players and what have you. Uh, the New Reality in 2017. So that's the trio of albums. Do they sound classic Queens Reiki? Does he sound okay? Yeah, I mean, he's still singing pretty good. He's not going for the, you know, the stuff you would hear, you heard him sing on Operation Mind Crime or Rage for Order or that type of thing. Uh, but he's still Jeff Tate. The music is kind of bland. It's kind of proggy, but not. It certainly isn't metal. It doesn't, you know, I mean, he's gone on record numerous times saying that he's really not into the whole heavy metal thing anymore. And you can kind of tell by listening to those albums. They're kind of bland. They don't really do a hell of a lot. Uh, the other guys in the band, they come out with The Verdict in 2019, which I think is in my car. I couldn't find it. Uh, and that, another tremendous album of songs that just sound like classic Queensryche. So, but, you know, there's been the issues in the Queensryche camp as well. You've got, you know, Scott is now, is now having issues with the guys in the band and he didn't play drums on the last album. Todd played all the drums. Now there's this issue. He's like, well, they're trying to force me out. The guys in the band are like, well, we're not forcing them out. He said he needed time away from the band. We never heard from him again. So who knows what's going on? Uh, I think Jeff is kind of sitting on the sidelines now watching that and laughing. But meanwhile, most of the kind of infighting has been between Jeff and the rest of the band. But I I think more importantly, and again, there's, there's all sorts of sides taking with this. There are people who are going to side with Jeff Tate no matter what. He was the voice of Queensryche, will always be the voice of Queensryche. He's, he's the guy. Queensryche is not Queensryche without him. Uh, but it's, you know, the funny thing is, is a lot of people who say that, they'll they go back to those early Queensryche classics and they're like, but that was the classic, you know, that's Queensryche. But they kind of forget all those 90s and 2000s albums that nobody was buying, nobody was listening to, that everybody disliked. And, you know, how much of that was driven by what he wanted to do? It's hard to say, right? Because you hear both camps say different things. But the important thing is, I think for now, is you've got a Queensryche band, which only has a couple of original members left, who are playing music in the spirit of the music that everybody loves. You got Jeff Tate, who's doing his own thing. He's the voice, 
but the music he's playing now is not really like that classic Queensryche material. So, uh, and you got to, the impression I get is a lot of people who have allegiance to Jeff Tate love to go see him live to hear him play Rage for Order and Warning and uh, Empire and Operation Mindcrime, full albums and all those songs. They have no interest in his solo stuff. They're like, ah, whatever. We just want to hear him play the classic stuff. We'll be happy for the rest of our lives. So it's an interesting situation here. Uh, where you have uh, the existing band trying to, you know, reignite the passion for that style and that sound, but obviously they don't have all the original members. And then you got the original singer who's kind of doing his own thing, putting out new records that nobody listens to and just playing the old hits, right? So it's a, it's a weird situation. I mean, we've seen this in other, you know, there's, there's other situations that are very, very similar to this, uh, but this is probably the most high profile one. So there you go. You know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and, and fall on the side of Operation Mind Crime because I always I always tend to I mean listening to all these comparisons both of us are doing I, I'm almost always on the side of of the band who's being a little more non obvious and creatively fearless and I know Queensrÿche we know exactly what they're doing and and I think Jeff Tate is uh, or Operation Mind Crime is heavy enough and interesting enough that I buy into him like when you talk to him. And, and, he, and he talks about creativity and talks about being really excited about creativity. I buy into it. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like enthusiastic with him. Uh, you know, obviously I think the nadir of both of these situations was, uh, was the likes of American Soldier and Q2K. And on Jeff's side, you know, specifically that Jeff Tate solo album. I mean, that, that's, that's definitely a bridge way too far. Um, you know, for, for, uh, for any of us, I, I suppose, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I again, it, it's a little bit of that. Uh, I just, I just feel like he's the guy who's doing it for art for art's sake, a little more than Queensryche is. Although I love both situations. I think they're both doing a good job. So there you go. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I find the operation my crime stuff just so damn bland and unmemorable. And I, I'll give you, I'll give you props. I think, you know, the fact that he's doing what he wants to do is fine. Yeah. Stick with it. You know, maybe it'll click at some point, but, but then he turns around and he goes and play and tours and he doesn't play any of that stuff. And he just plays, you know, we're going to do operation my crime in its entirety and the warning in its entirety. And it's just like, I mean, that's that's great because obviously the bulk of the fans don't want to go listen to songs from his solo catalog, right? I mean, it's just that's what it comes down to. But at some point, you got to, you know, if you're going to continue to do music, new music, you got to you got to stand behind it a little bit. Right. Uh, I'm all for him doing something different and, and doing his own thing. And, and, you know, whether I like it or not, doesn't really matter. But, you know, and then you turn around and you just go back to the well again. And that's really all you're doing. So I don't know. To me, it's, it doesn't sit well with me for whatever reason. Some of that I think is is the is the spite and the anger and rubbing it in their faces thing and 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 honestly I I think I think the um you know the the semi adjacentness of Operation Mind Crime musically to Queensrÿche obviously I think it's closer than you do but the fact that it's there at all I think even even is like a little bit well I'm going to show you and and that's why that's like that as well so yeah. all right uh, my next choice uh, I forgot to show this prop when I was talking about Alice Cooper the Dead Ringer album is in fact. Uh, Neil and Dennis doing something with Joe Bouchard, believe it or not, and Charlie Hune. I mean, it's this is crazy uh, that that, but it was not a very good album, and it was not, you know, it was on a small label and didn't do that well. But so, so they didn't do absolutely nothing. They just sporadically showed up here and there. But uh, so my next one is Rainbow versus White Snake, and uh, so we've got Rainbow, you know, second album. We go with Rising. There is no White Snake at this point. Uh, David Coverdale is uh, just coming up with his solo machinations when we get long live rock and roll and we get a later era with the band with these types of records right we've got in the middle we've got down to earth and then we've got the boy I pulled out all the props for this one didn't I uh, we got uh, that there so and you know white snake so so I think um, you know to say something a little comparative and different here I think again as as we talked about in the first episode when I was comparing white snake and Gill and I think white snake is a continuation of what David really likes but rainbow is a funny one it's a continuation of Richie with his big ego wanting to do what he wants but it seems like there's not really exactly one kind of music that he wants to do um, because it gets more commercial over time. But there's always the idea of, 
I, I really want to express myself in an artistic way in guitar soloing. So it is Richie's thing, um, but it doesn't seem like it's a, it's a straight continuation of, of the exact kind of music uh, that, that, you know, like there's one kind of music that he wants to do. Certainly, certainly rising uh, out more than anything and long live rock and roll and to some extent, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, the first one, are, are like, I, I don't want to do the blues and funk and I want to do the heavy stuff. But uh, as we see later on, it changes quite a bit and he's more into the commercial foreigner stuff. So that's kind of kudos to him uh, that he's doing that. Whereas White Snake seems to be on a trajectory, um, you know, with slight adjustments as we move on, you know, to the big corporate American thing eventually. Um, but it's still the boogie woogie rock and roll. I love the blues. You know, I, I love my old English roots music, essentially, uh, that you get out of David Coverdale. If I was to choose between them, I would say, I would say uh, Rainbow. Um, and, you know, I would say more so because of the comparison between I love early Rainbow to death. They're amazing. Um, but early Dave is really hard to listen to, uh, especially those two solo albums. I don't I don't want to hear the funky rock and roll barrel house boogie, whatever you want to call what he's doing on those records. And I don't think I don't like trouble a heck of a lot. And I don't even like Love Hunter a heck of a lot. Really? Um, no, it's, uh, you know, I, I like the heavy metal songs that he does. You know, I'm, I'm pretty easy to please that way. I love Ready and Willin a lot. As, yeah, as well, well, right? Pretty much everything moving forward. But uh, big, 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 big win on the early end. And uh, and I'm perfectly happy with Joe Lynn Turner Rainbow as well. I like that as well. So I'll go Rainbow on this one. Do you think Richie was kind of pissed off at the success of White Snake? Because quite frankly, yeah, White Snake got bigger than, than the Deep Purple reunion or the Rainbow stuff put together. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. That's a great question. Eh? What was he thinking looking at that, right? Looking at how huge that thing got. And Richie was Nowheresville, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, so we've got, uh, we've got, I guess, House of Blue Light. Is it the exact same year as White Snake 87? Are they both yeah, 87? I think so. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. Uh, so, so yeah, so Deep Purple is in operation and then they do the 1990 album with Joe. So they're still sort of quote unquote in operation. It's the years are apart, right? We get an 84 and 87 and 90 and then a 93, I think it is, right? Yeah. So Deep Purple's going the whole time, but White Snake is huge. You're right. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. I never really thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for me, looking at the both catalogs, I mean, I, I generally, when I look at like my favorite bands of all time, I generally rank White Snake just a little bit higher than Rainbow. They're, they're both like top five bands for me. Um, I, I think, you know, you, you got more albums from White Snake, obviously. And I think, you know, like the, the Ronnie albums, of course, are Holy Grail stuff. I love Down to Earth. I, you know, I really enjoy Difficult to Cure Straight and Bent Out of Shape. Uh, I don't know, but for me, it's like Slide It In, the 87 album, uh, Come and Get It. I like Trouble and Love Hunter quite a bit. Ready and Willing is great. I don't know. It's, it's hard. I mean, this is, it's hard because to me, they're so well balanced and, and I really love the, both catalogs so much. So it's, it's hard to say. I, like I said, I generally rank White Snake as my number three band of all time. And, but Rainbow is like right behind them. It's like, you, you know, you got, you got Heap and, and Rainbow kind of sit just outside the top three. But, you know, to say it's the top five band, I mean, that's, that's pretty good, right? So. so what's first, Purple? Purple, Sabbath, White Snake, usually Sabbath. Heap and Rainbow or Rainbow Heap. It's usually, yeah. Wow, okay. Wow. All, yeah. all in the same sort of camp, right? I, mean, I know, right? How weird is that? <laughs> And all British bands. It's like most most of my favorite bands are all British bands. I mean, I do have, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Kansas and Styx yeah. and Dream Theater and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, most of my favorite groups of all time are not American bands. I sometimes have to remind myself and shake my head and go, really? Ronnie James Dio was never in Deep Purple? That's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> he should have been, right? <laughs> it makes perfect sense, right? Keep it all in the family. So... <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to talk about a American band right now. So uh, the whole journey versus um, Steve Perry thing. So as we know, um, Journey was a pretty huge band throughout the 80s. Uh, then they started to get a little less prolific as the 80s started to kind of finish out. We had Steve came out with a uh, 
with a solo album uh, in the 80s. Then, of course, he had uh, For the Love of Strange Medicine in 1994, which was at the height of the whole kind of grunge and alternative thing. And, you know, by, by this point in time, Journey was kind of like not really doing much of anything. Uh, they basically came back together as a unit for the Trial by Fire album, which did pretty good business, but they didn't tour behind it. You can kind of, the writing was on the wall that it just seemed like that marriage was no longer going to last. So they basically, that was the last time that they recorded anything together. And that, that was, you know, quite a while ago as it is. So eventually a couple of years later, the band decided to replace him and get a, a new singer and continue on as journey. Originally they hired a guy named from Brooklyn named Steve O'Gary uh, good vocalist, good singer, kind of had a little Perryism going on with his voice. They released uh, with him uh, Arrival in 2000 and then Generations in 2005. They also did an EP as well. Uh, eventually, he started having vocal problems. I guess trying to sing that material uh, every night on tour is not really good for anybody. I mean, even Steve Perry had issues with that after a while. Uh, so they replaced him briefly with Jeff Scott Soto, which brings a different element because he doesn't sing like either of those two guys, but that didn't really last too long. Uh, eventually, they found a guy from the Philippines who was in a Journey tribute band uh, that they found on YouTube called uh, Arnel Pineda. Different look, right? But he had a very similar vocal style to Steve. And of course, they released... Uh, the Revelation album with him and then the Eclipse album with him. He's now been in the band. So Revelation was 2008. So do the math. I mean, he's been in the band now for 13 years. Uh, they tour constantly. They've got a new album in the works. Um, and, you know, all while this is going on, uh, you really don't hear anything from Steve Perry. He basically goes into seclusion after his For the Love of Strange Medicine album in 94. And we don't hear another thing from him till 2018 for his uh, last uh, solo album, Traces. Uh, but, you know, again, the album's released. You don't really hear much about it. Uh, you know, the longtime Journey fans, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure lapping it up right. But it's, it's a very poppy album. It's decent. He sounds pretty good, uh, but he doesn't tour behind it. Doesn't, other than a couple sporadic live appearances, uh, he still stays pretty quiet. He shows up on stage with the band to accept the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction uh, nomination uh, at the awards ceremony, but does not sing with the band. And now it's back, you know, he's quiet once again. And, and you know, there have been all sorts of things going on in the journey camp, you know, with Steve, uh, Steve Smith and Ross Valerie, and there was a split there. Now they've got some two new guys in the band. So really interesting, the kind of the career of journey over the last like 30 years has been lots of kind of crazy things happening and people coming and going and infighting and this, that, and the other thing. But, uh, but yeah, the two, you know, Steve Perry and the band never to, to work together again after Trial by Fire. And, uh, you know, Journey's still releasing new music every so often. And uh, it sounds like Journey, right? And I guess that's what they're going for. They're one of the many bands, kind of like Foreigner, who went out and got a guy who kind of fits the same mold, kind of sounds similar because as uh, a lot of these legacy bands have found, Yes did the same thing. People want to hear the songs that they love sounding kind of the same. So to bring in a new singer after your, your legendary singer has left or passed away or whatever, with someone who sounds completely different, that generally doesn't work. Uh, but, you know, Martin, you've talked a lot about how important the vocalist is. And I think a lot of people feel that way with these bands that have these rich, huge catalogs. If they're going to continue to go on uh, with, with someone new behind the, the mic, got to get someone who makes these songs sound similar, right? And it, I mean, the Van Halen that we did uh, earlier is a perfect example. I mean, Sammy, completely different than David Lee Roth, right? But that kind of worked. But in a lot of these instances, uh, it might not work the same, so. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's, I, I just read recently, there was a really devastating, cool interview that someone brought up again of, with Journey's manager, Howard something or other. And uh, yeah, crazy, crazy stuff between Steve and them. He's 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 got some weird ideas about life and uh, and the business and stuff. So yeah, it was it, it's pretty revelatory of why they couldn't work together. So yeah, yeah, and and he you know he did not want to tour, do all that touring, and you know Journey is a touring machine. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. And whether he just can't can't do it physically, or whether just being on the road. I mean, he had his health issues, obviously, but. Um, 
yeah, yeah, he's but he still he still collects a paycheck, right? Yeah. He's still on I think the board, right? So the or whatever it's called, he still mm-hmm. uh, collects his money to just not do anything. But yeah, yeah, cool. All right, my last one for this episode is accept versus udo, or if you want to be more formal about it, u dot d dot o dot u d o, right? U d o, as the man told me himself a couple of weeks ago. That's how we say it. I'm like, what's oh, that? It's the name of the band is u d o. Udo Dirk Snyder organization. That's yeah. UDO. I, I, UDO, yeah. <laughs> when I talked to him, I said, oh, the new Udo album is not, not it's, the, it's the UDO. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Wow. Okay. I, I, all right. I stand corrected. <laughs> a little deal, a little UFO in there, right? Yeah. Um, all right. So the first skirmish they had was uh, when he's out of the band and they get David Reese in and they do this album, Eat the Heat. And, um, you know, famously suffers from a uh, very, very clattery 80s production and 80s sort of writing. And this was uh, this was kind of like a big bomb uh, situation. But the clash there is that uh, Udo Dirk Schneider puts out his first UDO album um, uh, and uh, uh, it, Animal House. And it sounds just like the next Accept album. And essentially, it proves that he loves that kind of music. And that's what he wants to do. And he's got that great voice, legendary, legendary voice. And they don't miss a beat. But nobody really makes it very big. I mean, they're, they're sort of above the radar anyways. And, uh, uh, but, but not really big. Uh, they come back together. They do some some other stuff, and and it's always of a very high quality. Uh, that's one of the cool things about Wolf. They they don't they've never turned in a pooch. Uh, these guys. I mean, maybe maybe Eat the Heat and maybe just the I'm a Rebel album. Other than that, everything else is of a pretty high standard, right? Um, but uh, the interesting situation is uh, UDO just keeps making lots and lots of records. Great production. They, they kind of fall into this really, really high tech, almost Pantera-esque drum sound. Um, very, very like, uh, you know, uh, hammer, hammers on a, on, a, on a marble tabletop sort of, uh, uh, you know, technical sheen to the whole thing, right? Um, he, he loves that sort of sound and they keep making lots and lots of records. And uh, lo and behold, except finally comes to terms with uh, with the new singer. And, uh, you know, they enter the Mark Tornillo years and they've got I think it's five at this point. Um, five of these albums from from the Tornillo era. They're all great as well. So I want to end off on a note where they both win. I mean, I, I play every time I, pl- I put on one of those. UDO albums. They're they're always like really highly entertaining. There's a sense of humor there. They do a lot of kind of weird stuff that goes off on, you know, covers and classical and the Russian sort of thing and all that sort of stuff. But but the straight metal that they do, I don't like the super fast ones either, but but the groovy except type metal, they do as well as uh, as Wolf continues to do with Mark on the uh, on the Tornillo era uh, albums as well. So I, I think they're both winners in this case. It's really funny that dynamic between the two, uh, why they couldn't work t- together. Who knows? It's, they've always kept it kind of murky, but it does sound like Udo is a little bit of a, um, he, he is a little eccentric, I think, uh, but, but, but he plays his cards so close to the vest. You don't really, you don't really find out what's going on there. It's almost like the ACDC situation, the cloak of secrecy, right? Because Wolf seems like a pretty normal guy, you know, and then there's, they've had problems with Peter now, and they've obviously had problems with Herman Frank, right? Yeah. As well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, obviously there's some, there's some reason in there somewhere for these personalities to clash. Um, yeah. Not sure what it is, but they've both made great music. So I'm, I'm going to go with both as winners this month. I think the problem has got to lie somewhere between Wolf and, and Udo. It's got to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I just reviewed Game Over, the new uh, UDO album. And it, it's such, such high quality. I think 17 albums they've done. 17. They, they released like one or two more albums. I think he's, he's, yeah. he will now have, have put out double the amount of albums that he did when he was with Accept, right? It's, it's pretty yeah. close to that, right? Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. I know, right? Uh, and yeah, both, both are absolutely winners because uh, you know what you're going to get with both of them. And yeah, it, it, it is a shame they can't work together again because it's like you listen to, to both entities. It's like, wow, you can't miss with anything that they put out. Why can't they just kind of kiss and make up, right? But again, as, as we talked about in last episode with Lawrence Gowan and Dennis DeYoung, you've got a perfectly awesome guy in Mark Turnillo. So, so it's like 
this is not they need to work together again they don't. because there's a part missing from Accept. There's a great front man in Accept already. So it, it's like he's not needed. Just just when it, like, like when I talked to J.J. Burnell from The Stranglers, like you don't need Hugh Cornell back. You've got Baz in there. So, I mean, when, 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 when the parts are there, it's, it's now we just have two great bands. That's, that's yeah, because the UDL band is fantastic. I mean, those guitar players are immense. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they definitely don't need each other. I think the fans want it more than they do, because to them, they're like, we can operate separately for the rest of our lives. And we're totally fine with that. We'll just keep cranking out killer albums. Right. Yeah. All right. Much like I did on the, uh, the my last pick of the first episode, uh, I'm going to talk about a band and their major guitar player who left to go or was dismissed, I should say. Uh, White Snake and John Sykes. All right, so we've talked uh, a little bit about White Snake already, but obviously the two worked together uh, towards the tail end of the creation of uh, the Slide It In album and then the tour. And then John, because of the injury to Mel Galley, became the only guitar player in White Snake. And of course, they did the 87 album together, which, you know, we talked before about how many millions and millions of copies that has sold uh, to date and, you know, all these classic songs and whatnot. But by the time the album hit the streets, John was no longer in the band because him and David got into some sort of spat about something. David decided to scrap the whole band and start fresh. So basically John is left. All right. Got to do something else. Right. So uh, this is the result of the new white snake featuring Steve I on guitar. Also all new players in here. This album did pretty well compared to the album that came before it. Not really. It was kind of looked at as a disappointment, but it sold what I think it's done double platinum, I think to date or something, something like that, which platinum. you can't really sneeze at. So that was 1989, the same year John Sykes resurfaces with this power trio called blue murder self-titled he's on Geffen as well. So it's like he basically used his time in white snake to get himself a deal with the label. He's got Tony Franklin on bass and Carmine a piece on drums. Of course, Carmine, pretty prolific throughout the decade. He had the King Cobra thing going on. And of course he worked with Rod Stewart. He played with Ozzy, Jeff Beck. I mean, you know, Vanilla Fudge, so on and so forth, Cactus. So he's the big name in the band. Uh, and they released this album, which is very kind of white snaky 1987, maybe a little darker, a little more Gothic. It's, it's pretty much a, a metal album and he's singing uh, early on. He was going to, he had Ray Gillen on board. That didn't work out. And I guess after auditioning some people, he just decided to sing himself. He's got a perfectly fine voice, uh, but you can hear, you listen to this album and you can, and you listen to the 87 album, you definitely know that he had a hand in a lot of the writing of the songs on the 87 album. I mean, they're, they're, the albums sound very, very similar. Like I said, this is a little darker, uh, but you know, this didn't really sell like they thought it would. They went out and played live. It just didn't really capture the attention of the world like they thought it would. But again, it's 1989, right? So we know a change is a coming. So after the slip of the tongue tour, uh, David decides to kind of bury or table White Snake for a while. Of course, he goes off and works with Jimmy Page for Coverdale Page, which does fairly good business. But that tour turns out to be a disaster, basically kills that band as well. Uh, Sykes doesn't resurface again till uh, 1993. So four years later, he comes out with nothing but trouble which would, I guess, kind of foreshadow what he's done since because, you know, he still had the original trio together, but because they were taking so long in the studio, uh, basically Tony and Carmine were like, all right, you know, we got other things to do. We can't just work on this forever. So basically by the time this came out, they appear on the album, but they're not in the band anymore. I don't even remember, Martin, if they even toured this or not, or whether this just kind of came out and sank without a trace. So that was 93. Uh, since then, Sykes has done, you know, a, a couple of solo albums, but he hasn't done one in a million years. He's apparently had one finished for like a decade. We still haven't seen it. He keeps releasing songs, but the album never comes out. Meanwhile, David decided to resurrect Whitesnake for this album, which is called uh, Restless Heart. He's got uh, Adrian Vandenberg still kind of in the band, but this was 1997. So this was many, many years later. So almost a decade after the Slip of the Tongue album, and this basically does absolutely nothing. Uh, by this point in time, late 90s, you know, really Whitesnake is off the radar for most people. Uh, you know, new metal is kind of all the rage. We still have a little alternative. Grunge is kind of done by this point in time. So both of them uh, at this point 
not doing all that well. So who wins this? I'm going to say neither, because I think by the time both of these came out, uh, both, both acts are pretty much irrelevant at that time. Of course, Coverdale would uh, resurrect Whitesnake uh, a few years after that in the, in the spirit of the 80s bands and would have released a number of albums since that, you know, are, are fairly regarded by most people. I, I dig them quite a bit. Meanwhile, Sykes has just continued to do nothing. He was in the early lineup of the Winery Dogs with Billy Sheehan and Mike Portnoy. That was the original idea for that trio but again they just couldn't agree on the direction they were taking too long in the studio and Portnoy and Sheehan decided you know what we're going to go work with someone who's ready to do something now and put something together and they hooked up with uh, Richie Kotz and, and the rest is history so yeah no real clear winner there but I guess if you're looking at where they are today obviously David and Whitesnake uh, obviously have been the, the busier and probably over the span of that time are the clear winners so yeah. there you go. Yeah, and even that Blue Murder album was overworked, kind of overproduced. There's too many layers of things going on. It's kind of noisy, steely, tinny. But you look at that album cover. I mean, that was pretty interesting, you holding that up, because it looks like this is going to be a world-beating band. They've got a logo. They've got a great name. Just logo, boom, right in the middle of the... All-star right players, the right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you you would have thought, and then, wow, all the way to 93 until you get to nothing but trouble. That's that's crazy. But yeah, I, apparently i guess he's he's kind of a difficult guy to work with or get get to work kind of thing right um i guess his his vision of success doesn't match just the the standard you know rock and roll template of of, of trying to be successful right it, it's it's really hard to fathom i mean i i've got a few of his solo albums that he released in you know the late 90s and the 2000s you know, there's some good material on there, but, you know, there's some questionable directions. And I just, I don't know if he, re I think he just takes, he's like a Tom Schultz type of guy. He just takes so long and he's so meticulous and such a perfectionist that by the time that he's got some stuff in the can ready to be released, it's almost like he's looking at the musical landscape out there and saying, well, I don't know if this fits anymore. I, maybe I should just scrap it all and start again. And, and you blink yeah. it, 20 years have gone by. So I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. I, I, but everybody that you hear from who has worked with him, I mean, I, I talked to Carmine and Carmine basically told me, it's like, we have tried to resurrect Blue Murder on numerous occasions, but man, to get John to go and move forward on anything, he goes, I just don't have the time to wait for him because I got to do something else. And I've heard that from multiple people. So yeah. 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 cool. So, what are you going to do? So there you have it, everybody. Part two of Who Did It Better? Uh, Ten more selections for you. Uh, you know, curious to hear folks' thoughts on some of these factions and what you think and who you think did these better. Maybe you have some suggestions for other ones that we didn't cover. So uh, put those in the comments below. Martin, uh, what's going on at the Contrarians and uh, stuff in stock that you can be shipping out from martinpopoff.com? Yeah, we've got uh, back in stock uh, after three years away is the Max Webster book, which is doing well. Um, I, I don't know why I, le why I left it that long, but uh, yeah, I'm s selling, selling a lot of those. And the Flaming Telepaths, Imaginos Expanded and Specified is back after being uh, sold out. And uh, I've got the Yes Visual Biography back, still got the Heap one, got a good enough supply for a couple months probably of the Van Halen one. The Blue Oyster Cult one and the Thin Lizzy one, I think. Uh, so all that is at martinpopoff.com and Contrarians. Um, yeah, right around now we've been doing, what are we doing? Poison. We've got the Van Halen one out, ACDC. So uh, a bunch of those have come out as well. And then weekly, of course, I still have the podcast history and five songs with uh, Martin Popoff. Cool. I didn't hear you mention the Nazareth visual biography. So I missed oh, yeah, that one too. I keep forgetting. And then that the Hawkwind one is on its way over to me as well. There's so Ooh. many. And just got announced was the UFO one and the Judas Priest one. So those are announced, but those are still a few months away. But I finished them both a long time ago. Yeah, I, I saw an ad for the Judas Priest one. I'm like, ooh, Martin hasn't mentioned that. That looks pretty cool. So and a UFO one too. Wow. Yeah. Man, you're killing me, man. I'm going to run out of shelf space here with all these gigantic know, books. Yeah, you have to, you have to prop up the, uh, the, the, the floor too. They weigh a lot. <laughs> hey, they do that. They do. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So all available on martinpopoff.com uh, and soon to come. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, thanks for watching everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Stay tuned for 
uh, album homework assignment coming up on Sunday. And then, of course, Monday starts the week all over again. Hudson Valley Square is on Monday, in the prog seat Tuesday, Wednesday, new album review, Thursday, Monsters Den. And uh, oh, Martin will be back next Friday. So stay tuned for that as well. Uh, I am Pete Pardo for Martin Popoff. Have a good one, everybody. See you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>